Happy March 14th. It's somehow already super, super close to spring. Time is flying and we keep getting to do lessons together. And I know that I have so much fun and I hope you guys do too. Um, this morning, if you haven't said hello in the chat yet, consider saying hi. We love to hear how your weekend was, how your week um, might be going this week. Um, but most of all, we're just glad that you're here and listening. Um, we are going to jump in to our lesson this morning. We have Karen and Caden, Declan and Ruthie, who are going to teach us first part, um, tell the story with their amazing Lego creations. We're going to learn about the Apostle Paul and his shipwreck. Last week, you'll remember that we talked about Saul, who became Paul. And so this is that guy, the guy that was close to God and God broke him free from his sin. And now Paul travels around sharing the gospel with all kinds of people. He was an amazing man who had so much to share about how God transformed him and how much people need God so that God can transform them. And that's what we know is how much we need God too. So um, listen carefully to the story of Paul's shipwreck. And then after that, we will check in again um, because Karen and the kids have an amazing object lesson for us. And today's lesson is titled, We Are Protected by God. So enjoy. <laughs>
When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Andromidium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. We set sail again across the open sea. However, we had slow headway and difficulty arriving on another island because the wind did not let us hold our course. So we moved along the coast with difficulty and eventually came to a place called Fair Havens near the town of La Silla. Much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because it was late in the season. So Paul warned the men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, he followed the advice of the captain and the owner of the ship. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, most of the, the crew decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach another city and winter there. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought they had gotten what they wanted. So we pulled up anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But before long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not do very well in it. So we gave way to it and went where it blew us. Fearing that we would run aground, and taking such a violent battering, the crew began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard as well. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. But now I tell you, be brave. No one's going to be hurt. Only the ship will be destroyed. For last night, God sent an angel who stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar in Rome. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith that God will do just as he told me. On the 14th night, when we were still being driven across the sea, the sailors sensed that we were approaching land. So they took their surroundings and discovered that the water was getting shallow. Short time later, they took them again and found that it was even shallower. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors and prayed for daylight. Just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat again. For the last 14 days, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. Now I urge you, eat some food. You need it to survive. And after he said this, he took some bread, gave thanks, and, and ate it. And then they all felt a little bit better. Altogether, there were 276 people on board. And when they ate as much as they wanted, they threw the rest of the food into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run aground if they could. So they cut loose the anchors, left them in the sea, and then hoisted the sail and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow stuck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding surf. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners from, to keep them from escaping, but the centurion wanted to save Paul's life and told everyone to swim to shore. And those who could swim, swam, and those, the rest got there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. And this is a great lesson to show that God protects us just as he protected Paul in a great big shipwreck. Hi everyone. So you saw in the video earlier that we learned about Paul being shipwrecked, right? And how God protected him. So God stayed with Paul during the storm, right? And God helps us these days 
be protected too, right? So let's do a little bit of an experiment to see what sort of things can protect us from getting wet. <laughs> so we have here a spray bottle and then a few different things. And we're gonna take turns spraying and seeing what sort of things can protect us from this water. Are you ready, Kaden? Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is when we hold up something to spray, I want you to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you're watching online in the chat to let me know what you think, okay? And we have Declan and Kaden and Ruthie here to help. All right, so first off, we're wearing our hats to see if they protect us from getting wet. All right, did you get wet? Yeah. Yeah, Ruthie got wet. <laughs> got wet. You got wet, yeah. Okay. Now we have Declan here trying a face cloth to see if it's gonna keep him dry. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Declan doesn't think it's gonna keep him dry. All right, let's see. Oh, did you get wet, Declan, or were you dry? Soaked. Soaked? Okay. My face did, but not under the face you cloth. You me. Did I spray you? No, I no? can't. Okay. My face, not the face cloth. What about here we have just a piece of plain white computer paper. Do you think this will keep you dry? Thumbs down for Caden, he says no. Okay, put, hold it up over your head. Thumbs down, they say. All right, let's see here. <laughs> oh, did it get you wet? Oh, it got me wet. It got you wet? It didn't protect you very well, did it? All right, what about some Kleenex here? We have some Kleenexes. You want one, Mercy? Okay, All right, let's see. Put the Kleenex on and let's see. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Do you think the Kleenex is going to keep you dry? <laughs> Declan, Kaden, they say thumbs down. All right, are you ready? Yep. Did it keep you dry? My no. Does it run your hand? No, just not my shirt. Sure. What about your tissue? Is it pretty dry or is it getting pretty wet? Dry. No, not no, really. Not yes. super wet? Okay. So, what is it? Oh, it's an umbrella. Do you think an umbrella is going to keep you dry? Yes. Okay, how about you all get under the umbrella and let's see if the umbrella will keep you dry. Oh, Duckling gives a thumb up. Okay, you guys ready? Ruth, come on. Over here. All right, let's see. Did you get wet? No, no, oh, no. the umbrella protected you and kept you dry completely. All right, Declan, which one of these things did you think would help you stay the, the dry the best? The umbrella, right. Umbrellas are made to protect us from water, right? And they're made to protect us in rainstorms. And God is like that. God is the best at protecting us. So in this story, Paul went through a storm, but God was with him the whole time and protected him so that he made it safely to shore, right? So just like that, we can trust that God is with us today too, and that we are protected by him. That was super fun. Thank you, Karen and Declan and Caden and Ruth for showing us that the umbrella was a protection from water and that God is our protection in life. He wants to protect us, just like an umbrella wants to shield us from water. Thank you for that. So now I want everyone to take one quick minute, if, if you want, I encourage you to. We'll do a quick minute countdown and you'll go get paper and a pen, um, especially if you can write, I encourage you to do this. We are going to make a handprint on the paper. If you can see mine there, I got it ready. So take a minute. Pen, paper, and handprint, because we are going to write down five things that we can do when we need protection from God. And go.
All right, guys, welcome back. So if you are just listening and you didn't get your handprint, that's fine. Um, but if you're writing, I'm going to put the words up on the screen and you can copy or get your parents uh, to lend a hand with writing them down. Because life is really hard. We always have things that we need help and protection from. Uh, and they can be big, small, and in between. But the main thing is that God does offer us protection and he wants to help us. So on your hand, there's mine. It's on the back of a scrap piece of paper. So um, you will have your hand and then in each finger, you can write these reminders so that you can remember where to go when you need protection. So the first thing is on your thumb is ask for help. God wants to talk to you and pray and prayer is how we do that. So when you need help, you simply pray and that is a great start. So ask for help in the first one. And in the second one, we focus our trust in God. It's really hard sometimes to trust someone that we don't see with our eyes. But God is something that we can feel in our hearts and someone who guides us through our lives. So remember to put your trust in God. The third one is asking adults for help. Adults are in our lives because they care for us and want to see us through all the tricky times in life. Even if you don't feel like talking to your mom or your dad about something super, super hard and painful, you can always ask an adult for help because they care for you and love you. And the fourth one is keep praising God no matter what. It's, again, very hard when things are sad. But there are so many things that are happy in life and we can praise God for them. It's kind of like finding the joy in the tricky times, which you might have heard people tell you to do before. Find the good things and, and focus on those. And that's exactly what we have to do. Thank God for the good things. And number five is how we do that. We can praise God by looking for God in the things we can't expect. So number four was keep praising God no matter what. And number five is look for God in ways that we don't expect. Like a beautiful walk in the woods in the wintertime. You can look for God um, in a simple fishing trip with your family where you're like, oh, I don't even want to be here maybe because I don't love fishing. But you can choose to have a nice time, uh, even if you don't like being out on a boat, for example. Um, there are a lot of things that we can just choose to see the flip side uh, of a bad situation. So when you need protection, those are five things that you can do to feel close to God and, and feel protected. So I'll put those on a slide um, for kids to copy if you want to afterwards and it'll stay up for a little bit before our worship song. I hope you guys had a wonderful Sunday. It's been amazing chatting with you and I hope that if you're watching this at home um, that you are safe and happy and cozy and that you enjoy your week. Have a good one guys.
morning, everyone. In the cafe. You know, my roommate is taking a day off tomorrow to recuperate. I always get. Here's a night person. That effect. And that's because. The audit in the cafe, you can touch base with an usher. We also want to welcome our new elders to the board. So we have Jeff Dwyer and Lori Walker. We welcome them this morning as new elders to the board. And then we also want to thank Doug Connolly for his service on the board. And yeah, thank you. We thank him. And so we'll turn it over to Laura. Okay, good morning, everyone. Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Would you engage with us this morning as we praise and worship him? Those in person, in the auditorium, and in the cafe, please stand and sing with us. If you're joining us online this morning, um, feel free to stand if you'd like, but would you just engage and be present together with your family and with us this morning here?
You can be seated. Once again, if you're new here, we would really like to connect with you. So please don't leave today without connecting either at the back, um, at the welcome desk, or with an usher here in the auditorium or in the cafe. And online, you can connect with our host and by clicking on that uh, prayer request button. As a church, we regularly engage in spiritual disciplines. Last week, we engaged in the spiritual discipline of celebration. Thursday nights, we practiced uh, a spiritual discipline of praying together. And this morning, we're going to have a chance to participate in a spiritual discipline of giving. So online, there is a button in the chat, so you can click online to uh, be able to give. Here in person, there's baskets at the back of the auditorium or in the cafe where you can give your offerings and tithes. Our budget uh, so far this year as of February 28th was 107000 and our actual is 81800 And so we thank you, Bay Park, for giving so generously. Finally, spring is around the corner, and that means Easter is as well. So we'll be having an online-only Good Friday service at 10 a.m. And then Easter Sunday morning, there'll be an online and in-person service. We want to make sure that everyone pre-registers on the website for that if you're wanting to attend. We also have an outreach event going to be planned for that weekend. So if you're interested, make sure you touch base with someone this morning here, one of the ushers, or online with the hosts. Today is an exciting Sunday. There is a baptismal service this morning, and so let's welcome Paul. Well, this truly is an exciting morning to be able to gather together, Baptism Sunday. Our mission is to prepare fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And baptism is one of the ways we follow Jesus. I mean, think about it. Was Jesus baptized? Yes. Did Jesus command his followers to be baptized? Yes, we know that from Matthew 28 and other places in the Gospels. Did the early church baptize believers? Absolutely. We know that from the book of Acts and following. And so is it right and fitting for believers today to be baptized? You better believe it. Especially when you consider what baptism symbolizes. By sharing our faith journey and then being going under the water, we are declaring that we have been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, that our life is now hidden in Christ. And then in coming back up out of the water, symbolizing that we have been raised to new life, to a new and a living hope in Jesus Christ. We can say with the Apostle Paul, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's what it means to follow Jesus, and baptism is one of the ways we follow Jesus. And so in just a moment, Marilyn's going to come and share her faith journey uh, Marilyn also has some family here, Jordan, Oliver, and also some, some family, but also she's going to be sharing it with you, her church family. Her living story of just faith walking with Jesus, and after she has shared that, because it is COVID, and what a way, by the way, um, this is our first baptism since COVID, so what a way to celebrate a year um, with COVID, but because it is COVID, a few little changes, and so instead of having my mechanic's glove on, uh, Marilyn, I've got some actual hospital gloves on, um, some extra protective um, uh, hospital mask, um, but we just really rejoice at the opportunity to be able to gather together and hear what God is doing and to press into one of the very basic spiritual disciplines of following Jesus, baptism. And so folks, I encourage you, well, it's, she won't be able to see your smiles, but just crank those cheeks up so she can see it in your eyes. Um, and with that, Marilyn, I'm going to invite you to come and share your story. Folks, would you put your hands together? So bear with me, I'm pretty nervous. So I grew up in a practicing Catholic home. I never really questioned my faith until I was in the later half of high school. That's when I basically decided that God wasn't re real and religion was merely a way to justify our broken world. 
and provide comfort to the famous question, well, what happens to you when you die? This broke my mom's heart. Um, so sorry, mom. So my beliefs were never really challenged until I met my now husband. The first three years of our relationship, the topic of religion was our biggest conflict. So he really gave me a run for my money, providing convincing arguments as to why the Bible was true, although I would never admit that. It wasn't until I read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis that my perspective changed. I hoped I would read it and feel further secure in my disbelief. I hoped even more that I would receive a few bazingas to throw at my husband. None of that happened. So I began to have more questions, so I decided to dig deeper. So I'm a very logical, deep thinker, so knew if I looked at the hard evidence, I might find some answers. So I picked up yet another book, and it's funny because I'm not a reader, uh, The Case for Christ by Lee Stobel. So this book had me convinced that the Bible was true. However, I was still scared to admit that. Honestly, out of fear, I did not dive any deeper into my faith for some time. So now and then I would feel convicted, but to not want to commit fully. Looking back now, I think it's because I knew I would fail. I knew I could never fully turn away from sin, so thought, why should I even bother? Now I realize becoming a Christian is more about the relationship you create with Jesus. So at first I had no idea what that even meant. So he wants to spend time with you, both reading his word and in prayer, for he really adores you. He wants you to prosper, but will be there when you fall short, which you will. He will continue to take the blame for your failures because he loves you. So I'm not really sure when it happened, but I continued to read God's word, pray and lean on him through hardship, praise him during victories, and as a result, I grew in my faith. My perspective changed. I was more open to hear what he was saying. So most of all, my heart changed, and it's still changing. So I felt convicted for some time about getting baptized. I'd use excuse after excuse as to why I shouldn't do it. But I cannot shake this feeling in my heart that it's something I have to do. So let's do this. Marilyn, it is a joy on the profession of your faith to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you so much for a real and a living hope. God, that your love is real and that you shine light on each of our paths. Thank you so much for the way that you have guided Marilyn to faith, to hope, to life and to love in you, to relationship with you, God, to knowing you and to being known by you. God, thank you for filling her with your Holy Spirit and leading and guiding her through the ups and the downs of life. God, thank you for growing her faith. And God, thank you also for growing her hope and her love. God, we pray your continued peace, your continued strength, Holy Spirit, upon her. And God, that she would continue to experience the grace of your salvation and of your presence in her life as she continues to trust in you. And God, we commit ourselves to afresh today, God, just recognizing that you are life, that you are love, and that you are our life. And so we praise you for your good and faithful work in each one of our lives and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it is truly a joy to be able to witness a baptism. I just want to put it out there. If you've been thinking about baptism, even as Marilyn mentioned, wrestling with baptism, it's something that has been pressing on you. And you're a believer. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Then I would encourage you, don't put it off. Later is not the time to get baptized. Now is the time. All you need to do is talk to us. And we'd love to share with you about baptism, what it means, what it signifies. And we can fill the tank anytime. So if God is pressing you on this, don't delay. Follow the Spirit's prompting. Amen.
What an awesome opportunity it is to witness a baptism this morning here in Canada and the freedoms we have. I know up north in Moosonee, where I lived for over 20 years, we would get baptized in the river. It's very cold up there. It's about 15 hours north of here. So let's um, dedicate our service to the Lord and uh, dismiss our children in a moment. We'll pray over them. Father God, you are so, so good, and we praise your name this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and minds. And I pray that you prepare us for your word this morning, the truth, that it will go out uh, boldly this morning. And we uh, pray over our children and the, the volunteers working with them, that they will feel loved and safe and uh, really know what it is that you love us. And so we uh, give you this day, and we give you this service, and we pray that you will be glorified in all our words and our actions. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to dismiss the children that pre-registered for our kids' time, so you're going to head out this door over here, all the children that were registered for this time. As the children head out, let's... Uh Let's take this time to reflect on what we've witnessed and heard in Marilyn's baptism and her testimony. And spend this next time uh, as we sing, thinking about and affirming uh, the gospel. Could you stand with us? In Christ alone. my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, far through the fiercest drought and the storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory.
Please be seated. Well, good morning to everybody. Uh, if you want to start to open up, uh, it's going to be on the screen, but if you want to use your phone or your Bible and open up to John chapter 6, verse 12, John chapter 6, verse 12. As you open up to that, I'm going to say a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a story of your great grace in Maryland's life. We pray, Jesus, that your grace would work in our hearts even right now. Even as we look at your word, just speak and move into our hearts, Holy Spirit. Soften them to your leading, to your guiding. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6, starting in verse 12. When they, the disciples and the crowd, when they had enough to eat, he, Jesus, said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let Nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and take and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. We're going to keep going, but we'll pause there for a second. I want you to picture that crowd of 5,000. In a crowd of 5,000, there's going to be some interesting characters. We know amongst the people that flocked to Jesus, there were some who were broken, there were some who were impoverished, There were some who were immobile. There were some on the margins. But among that crowd that day, when Jesus fed the 5,000, there were some political dissidents. Some folks that were tired of the taxation. (laughs) They were exhausted with the games of Rome and hurt by the hypocrisy of the higher up. They watched Jesus slice a few loaves of bread into a thousand pieces, and their jaws hit the ground. This is literally the best thing since sliced bread. They think, could this be the prophet that Moses foretold long ago? The passage they had heard a million times in Shabbat school races through their mind. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me among you. And then a voice calls out from the crowd, This is the coming one! The overthrower of Rome! cries another. The deliverer of the Jews. And soon a chorus of folks cry out in a revolution. There are men pushing their way through the crowd to get to the front like fans in a concert. Their their minds race with these images. These images of Jesus on a horse. Maybe a sword drawn. A pool of Roman blood. But Jesus is nowhere to be found. He's vanished. He's left nothing but a set of footprints heading for the hills and a host 
of unfulfilled expectations. Let's pick up in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The disciples are dead center in the Sea of Galilee, and it's nighttime now. They're rowing by the dim light of the stars in the sky. Why are they in the middle of a sea... At nighttime, they're not being irresponsible, they're just doing what Jesus told them to do. But where is Jesus anyway? He's not with them. He's up in the hills praying or meditating or something. And now a strong wind is blowing down those same hills, stirring the water. The waves are picking up. The disciples are probably saying their prayers probably questioning Jesus under their breath, wondering, why did he send us out here? Now John's gospel makes it seem like everything happened so fast. It's like they're in the boat, the storm comes, but then Jesus comes and calms the storm, yada, yada, yada. But another gospel, Matthew's gospel, really shows what happened here. Jesus sends off his disciples in the boat at dusk. And when does Jesus come on the water? At dawn. Now put yourself in the disciples' boat that night. Eight to ten hours is a long time to ride in a rickety fishing boat like some broken down attraction at Canada's Wonderland. Those disciples might have felt abandoned, and Jesus was nowhere to be found yet. And finally, John 6, starting in verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there, and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. We often picture the crowd that flocked to Jesus like a crowd of bystanders that are zombies and just kind of absent-mindedly following him around. But this is not some cool kids squad. This is, <laughs> this is a group of some hurting, broken, dirt poor, sick, ailing folks. And Jesus had virtually fed them bread from almost nothing. And as the sun bursts out over the Jordan hills, their bellies are hungry for breakfast. So imagine their disappointment when they return to the same stretch of shore where Jesus had given them supernatural food, and there's nothing there but the imprint in the sand where the boat was once drug to dry land. Again, Jesus is nowhere to be found, And their bellies ache, hungry, with unmet needs. Unfulfilled expectations, unanswered cries, unmet needs, and a God we can't find. 
It's not so different for us sometimes. Kind of like those would-be revolutionaries, some of us today are zealous, religiously minded folk who want to take up our weapons. Maybe Jesus is a warrior of traditionalism. Maybe we want to merge the church with the state. We want to revolutionize and insert God's kingdom right now. Thank God for unfulfilled expectations. But before we let ourselves off the hook, we could find ourselves on the opposite extreme. Using the love of God to justify support of the very things God warns will destroy us. We might have predetermined to live our lives a certain way, but we keep bumping up against some awkward scripture passages that challenge our moral presuppositions. Once more, we find some unfulfilled expectations of what the Christian life will be. But there's more. Maybe the missionary or ministry leader who set off with visions of supernatural revival. Maybe the convert to Christianity that fell in love with Jesus and thought life with God would be easier and they find that it's actually ten times more difficult. Maybe the single that craves intimacy and romance. The camp staff that wonders what happened to the presence of God in the school year. The addict that wants to be free. The person that prayed a thousand times to be delivered from temptation but they just keep failing. Unfulfilled expectation. Unfulfilled expectations. Unfulfilled expectations. And Jesus is off in the hills, and we're sitting in the rubble of our hopes and dreams. And what of unanswered cries? When the diagnosis comes, and we look to heaven, and we say, God, take it away. When we sit in the hospital holding a loved one's hand and we cry, not yet, God. When we're pulled into the boss's office, sent packing up our desk and we say, not now, God, not now. When we say, God, show me you're real. God, take away this mental illness. God, help. And our cries seem swallowed by the stormy gale. And it's the dark 11th hour and Jesus is not yet anywhere to be seen. And then there's our unmet needs. From the bills that need paying, to the mows that need feeding, to the kids that need clothing, to the pain that needs healing. From the fellowship we're lacking, to the hugs that we're craving, and the moments that we're missing, the job that needs finding, and the future that needs guiding, We pray for our daily bread, but it seems the breakfast table's empty and Jesus is off who knows where. Unfulfilled expectations, unanswered cries, unmet needs, and a God who doesn't take the un away. But here's another un. The uncomfortable truth that Scripture teaches the uncomfortable truth that sometimes God says no. Sometimes the answer's no. Think of these revolutionaries after Jesus fed them bread. Their cries for revolution went unfulfilled. Rome carried on for some time, oppression didn't cease, injustice didn't stop, and Jesus died probably one of the most obscure deaths he could have died at the time. The cries for a Jewish uprising found the answer from God, no, no, no. And sure, Jesus showed up in the stormy sea story, but only after the longest night of the disciples' lives. Only after they were leaning over the rowboat, puking up their dinner of supernatural bread. Only after Peter tries to walk the plank and nearly drowns. But for a long time, during this longest night of their lives, the answer to their cries for rescue, no, not yet, no. And the people 
that were hungry, the crowd that wanted just some food. Jesus rebukes them for looking for food. He answers with a puzzling response later in John 6 that what they need is not not supernatural but physically provided bread, but God. (laughs) They wanted fresh baked bread for their hungry bellies, but the harrowing answer was no. Not now. No. We don't like no. We don't want no. We want anything but no. But any parent will tell you, and I'm not a parent, so I take this for my friends, any parent will tell you, sometimes no is the most loving answer. Mom, Dad, can I play with some matches? No. Can I toboggan off the roof into the snowbank? For most parents, they'd say no. Can I go over to Sally's house? No. And what's the response? Why? Well, you might light yourself on fire. You'll, you probably won't hit the snowbank you're aiming for. And Sally's parents aren't home and it's a school night. Parents say no because they know better and they know more, whether kids want to admit it or not. And they're just looking out for their kids. It's not a whole lot different with our heavenly parent, except their requests are a whole lot more complex And the no, accordingly, is a whole lot more nuanced. But there's love in the no. God's no isn't a cold no. There's grace in the no. Jesus tells the hungry masses that their unmet needs for bread point them to their true hunger. That What they need more than daily bread is not the bread that Jesus will provide physically, but the bread of life that Jesus is. As Jesus says in John uh, chapter 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whosoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever comes to me will not thirst. Jesus takes their unmet needs, and though the answer is no, Jesus uses this to give them a greater yes. Their unmet needs teach them to hunger for Jesus. If Jesus gives them bread, their full bellies might coax them into apathy. And Jesus then uses this hunger to funnel their desire towards God. To use it as a spiritual training ground to teach them to look to Him. And notice that Jesus doesn't appear in the boat immediately. And when Jesus does appear, He appears on the stormy sea. The unanswered cries remain unanswered, but behind the no is a greater yes. Jesus wants to teach the disciples to sail through the storm, not merely escape it. Jesus appears on the raging waters and will call Peter to walk on them too. The unanswered cry becomes a spiritual training ground to strengthen the disciples' resilience, and literally in that moment, their sea legs, and to deepen their trust in God. And, unsurprisingly, Jesus denies the request for revolution. He leaves these men with some serious letdowns, but behind the no is a greater yes, the way of the cross. Indeed, Jesus is the coming one. He is the prophet of whom Moses spoke. He is the king, but he's come to take away the sin of the world. He's come to prophesy God's grace for Roman and Jew, for would-be revolutionary and progressive, 
for have and have not. And his throne will be the cross. And thank God for his heavenly, fatherly no to some of the things we want. Thank God for the grace of no. Even Jesus experienced the sting of no. In the Garden of Gethsemane, before he'd finally be hailed king, before the agonizing crucifixion, Jesus prays to God, take away this cup, this suffering from me. And we know how that was answered. An unfulfilled expectation, an unanswered cry, an unmet need, and God's uncomfortable answer of no. But thanks be to God for His no, because Jesus went to the cross, He went against the revolutionaries' expectations, against the disciples' cries of protest, and against His need to run away. And now, as 2 Corinthians puts it, All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for His glory. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. But notice, it's all of God's promises. It's the things that God has spoken into motion. The prophecies God has made in the Old Testament. The desire God has for justice and reconciliation that He answers with a yes in the broken and resurrected body of Christ. It's God's promises that are a yes. Meanwhile, our own expectations, cries, and even needs might find a no. Sometimes we'll pray our prayers and close with a hearty amen, which just means, yes, God. And God shakes His head and He says, sorry, not yet, or even no. Are we okay with that? Can we live with that? I think we can. I think the Holy Spirit can maintain our faith and our strength in the face of a no, because there's grace in the no. And no is still an answer. No is even an indication of God's presence. When the revolutionaries, the disciples, and the hungry crowd is seeking Jesus and can't find Jesus, it's because they're looking in the wrong place. They're looking in the yes to their request. Sometimes, no, is God's most loving reply. But it's written in cursive on a letter soaked in tears and signed, Love, your Heavenly Father. God graces the ultra-conservative or would-be revolutionary with a no, and He leaves them with unrequited dreams because He's showing them a greater yes the way of the cross. God uses difficult Scripture passages to say no to the way we want to live our lives because God loves us too much to let us live to our every destructive whim and desire. And maybe God graces the missionary and the ministry leader with a no because He's not after revival, but He's after faithfulness. And maybe God is gracing the single with a no because He wants to show them the greater yes to be found in the love and intimacy of Christ. And maybe God is gracing the addict with a no because they're going to learn the sustaining power of the Holy Spirit to fight temptation at every step. And maybe, just maybe, my suggestions, God is gracing us with a no when when we ask Him to take away sickness, mental illness, or COVID-19 Because He's showing us a greater yes to be found in our sustenance in Jesus and not our circumstances. And maybe He's gracing us with a no when we ask for that job because He's wanting us to find the greater yes to be found in our identity with Christ. 
And maybe he's gracing us with a no when we ask for that house because he wants us to find the greater yes in being grateful and living simply. And these are just my guesses. I can't prophesy why some get no's and others yeses. All I can tell you is that sometimes the answer is no, but it's a loving no with a greater yes in the backdrop. And the greatest yes is to be found in Jesus who said yes to welcoming us into his kingdom. This week, I have a simple challenge for you. I want you to examine some of your current unanswered prayers. Look at some of those prayers that you're afraid that maybe God might be saying no. How could this be a gift? And what might be the greater yes? Let's look at some of our current unanswered prayers and consider where God might be saying no. Consider how might this be a gift? Where might there be a greater yes? And that's my challenge for you this week. Like the revolutionaries, the disciples, and the crowd, where might God be gracing us with a no? And can we look, watch, and study the Holy Spirit's moving to see where He might be hovering over the stormy waters or feeding us supernatural bread, saying no to our request, but offering us a greater yes in Christ. Unfulfilled expectations, unanswered cries, unmet needs, and a God who loves us too much to always say yes. Let's pray. Father, I I close today with the words attributed to an American soldier in prayer. Lord, we ask for strength that we might achieve, but you've made us weak that we might obey. God, we ask for health that we might do greater things, and you gave us grace that we might do better things. God, we ask for riches that we might be happy, and you've given us poverty that we might be wise. We ask for power that we might have the praise of others. And we were given weakness that we might feel the need of God. We ask for all things that, might, that we might enjoy life. Yet we were given life that we might enjoy all things. Lord, even if we've received nothing we've asked for, we have all that we hope for in you. And Father, May our prayers be answered with a greater yes, and for it we are most blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. And I also want to end with a blessing. I just ask you to put your hands out in front of you, and just receive the greater yes God might be giving you today. God works all things for the good of those who love Him. May you, Bay Bay Park, who have been called according to His purposes, realize that they're His purposes and not your own. Go in the peace of His greater yes, all of the promises of God answered in Christ. Amen.
the future brings. I will watch and wait for the Savior King. Then my joy complete, standing face to Well, we want to thank our worship team, and I thank Ryan for the word this morning. And it just drew me in, especially when Jesus was walking on the water in the storm. And then he calls Peter out to him on the stormy waters. It reminds me of Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. And so we find our strength in the Lord this morning. Amen? <laughs> um, our life groups this week or in your homes right now, if you're watching online, we encourage you to take a picture of the questions. You'll be able to discuss them together and uh, work through the challenges and questions there. And so we, we bless you this morning. We thank you for being here, and happy Sunday to everyone. Those, those of us here in person, if you have children, in the uh, kids program, you're welcome to go get them. If you want to stay in fellowship a little bit, don't congregate in the foyer. Stay in the auditorium or the cafe area. Of course, we're keeping our distance a little bit and uh, taking care of each other, being safe, right? Have a good day, everyone. <laughs>